So everybody, welcome to class today. I'm so glad that you could join us. This is basic class four. So just to let you know what we've done in the past few weeks, we've had a class on getting to know family search, adding and correcting information in the tree, and finding people to add to tree. If you missed any of those classes, we just posted a link in the chat to the page that has the recordings. And so today is our fourth class, and this is actually a really exciting one for me because it kind of is the culmination of everything else that we've been talking about. But if you weren't able to catch the other classes, don't worry because this class does stand on its own. And I realize you'll be able to go back and watch the recordings too, but I didn't want you to say, oh, maybe I shouldn't come to this class because it's the fourth one. No, stay. This, this class will stand on its own even though it builds on what we've talked about. So I did want to give a teaser for the next class coming up, which I'm also very excited about, or I should say the next series, which is Intermediate Family Search. So we've got two classes on duplicates, one about the change log, which I think is one of the least used but most helpful tools in Family Tree, which is why we chose to include it. And then we'll have a special final class in the intermediate, intermediate series on recognizing and fixing sticky problems. Just what Elder Esplan was talking about. He finds that sometimes people come in and untend his tree. And so this will, this particular class will talk about how to deal with that. Oh, and I should say next week is Memorial Day in the United States and or Memorial Day weekend, I should say, in the United States. So we won't be having classes next Sunday. We'll pick up again two weeks from today. OK, so overview of what we're talking about in today's class. First of all, you might be one of the people, and if so, I admire you for coming to this class. You might be one of those people who hears the word research and goes, I hate research. It sounds horrible. It sounds boring. It sounds like I can't do it. And so we're first of all going to talk about some of the reasons that many of us might feel that way. And then we'll talk about a very simple but effective research cycle, followed by a demo of using the research cycle. And finally, we'll talk about how you can save your sanity. And I'm not kidding how you can save your sanity literally with a research log. And do you know what, everybody, I realized that I forgot to do a tiny little bit of housekeeping. Uh, we, we encourage you to chat with each other in the chat, but I won't be monitoring that. I just found that I can't focus on that and focus on the presentation very well. Maybe it's just I don't multitask too well. But if you have a question that you would like addressed during the webinar, please click the Q&A button on your Zoom toolbar. And then those I'll be answering every time we come to a break. So particularly, if you have a question about something that I've just said and it doesn't make sense, or you want some clarification, that's a good thing to put in the Q&A. If you're talking about other things in the chat, like maybe side questions about research or something, go ahead and put those in the chat and at the in its as opposed to the Q&A. And at the end, we will pick up any questions that we didn't pick up in the chat already. So because I know the missionaries are monitoring the chat and they will do their best to answer those questions as well. Okay, so back to the presentation. These are our four agenda items for today. So let's dive in. First of all, how did research get such a bad reputation? Why do so many people just panic when they hear the word research and they automatically think that they can't do it. Well, I actually think there's a couple of really good reasons for that. So if you're one of these people that feels like this about research, we want to talk about why and why it matters. So why the negative reaction? Well, Honestly, I think a lot of it has to do with bad past experiences, both in family history, but also maybe in school where somebody, a teacher assigned you to write a research paper, and then it came back with red marks all over it, or they didn't give you sufficient instruction, or whatever the case may be, you, you, you learned, learned from that experience that research is hard and horrible and that you just don't get it. 
there may be, a, okay, here's another one. We hear other people complain about research. So I'll share with you an interesting experience I had as a kid. So I loved school. I loved going to school. This was probably about kindergarten or first grade. I loved learning. The activities were fun. But then I heard my friends start to complain about school. And I was like, oh, maybe I'm not supposed to like school because none of my friends like it. So then I started complaining. Sometimes I think that happens with research. We hear other people complain about it. And then we kind of adopt that negative mindset. Another big obstacle is if we don't know how. And honestly, it can be really hard to explain in an understandable way how to do family history research. I'm hoping that today we'll, we'll do a little bit of that to make it less intimidating and more understandable for you. Or for those of you who already know how, maybe you'll learn something from this class that will help you to teach others and help them not to be intimidated. Another issue is that people don't know the benefits of research, and we'll be covering those today. And then finally, there are a lot of incorrect assumptions going around about research. We are so blessed to have amazing technology, but I've actually heard we had a good brother with the best of intentions get up in church and announce to the entire ward that research was no longer necessary because the computer did it all for you. Well, I can kind of see where he got that impression because the computer certainly helps us a lot, but it's really a stretch to say the computer does it for us. We still have to follow the spirit. We still have to use our minds that God has given us so that we, we can't just assume the computer is going to take care of it all correctly. So those are the, that's one example of correct, incorrect assumptions that you might hear floating around. So if we adopt those negative attitudes towards research, what are the consequences? Well, one consequence that I've noticed is that some people will just say, forget it, I'm not going to do family history, and they stay away. And if the consultant invites them to do it, they go, nope, Aunt Susie did it all or whatever. They'll give you any excuse to not do it because who wants a failure experience, right? And that's what they're assuming will happen. And so they just stay away from family history. But then we get the opposite extreme where people may not stay away from family history, but they'll avoid research. And so either as a result of avoiding research, some work doesn't get done, some temple work, because the only way you can do it is by doing a little bit of research, or they make avoidable mistakes. They think, oh, if it says in family tree, it's a duplicate, it must be, I don't have to double check it. Or if it says that this source is for this person, I don't have to use my mind to double check it. I just believe the computer's right and I just move forward attaching it and whatever. And so when we avoid that type of research, we actually do tend to make mistakes that we could have avoided if we'd just done a little bit of research. So that brings us to the next point, and that is that if we have all these negative or many people have negative reactions to research, it's time to step back and ask, what exactly is research? Because sometimes we don't stop, you know, we just have all the negative baggage, but we don't kind of dig down to the root to see what it actually is that we might have negative baggage about. And I realize this doesn't apply to everybody, but I will bet you that either you or somebody you know has negative feelings. So we don't want to beat that into the ground, but I do believe it's a real problem. So I looked up the definition of research on Google doing, hey, Google, define research. Uh-oh. Now I knew it. She thought I was talking to her. I wasn't. I was just quoting. So we'll put the phone down. Can you hear her in the background? She's giving me a definition of research. But she doesn't have to because it's on the screen. So research simply means discover facts by investigation. Now, how many of you love watching like mystery and suspense shows. I do. And I think a lot of us do because we're watching somebody discover facts by investigation. And it's exciting. It can be this whole interesting trail. And we watch them make, you know, intuitive leaps and then prove their intuitions and so forth. And 
unless this was really fun and exciting, there wouldn't be so many shows on TV that did this type of thing. So to discover facts by investigation, that's all research is. That doesn't sound too intimidating, does it? That doesn't sound horrible or unpleasant. So I have to admit, I'm kind of a word nerd. I love finding out where words came from, like the etymology of them. So when I looked up research, I discovered that it comes from the old French. So the RE at the beginning just intensifies it. So it means a lot of it or, you know, intensely doing this thing. And then the other part of the word is just chercher, which simply means to search. So we could say this is intentional and even maybe intensive searching. But it's certainly nothing horrible. It's something that all of us can do and that yields great benefits and blessings. So that's the general definition of research. But what does it mean specifically in the field of family history? What facts are we trying to discover by investigation? Well, it's actually pretty simple. We're trying to discover facts that allow us to uniquely identify a person. So how do we tell one John Smith from another or one Diego Martinez from another? Well, most of the time it will be by vital events such as birth, marriage, or death, or or I should say, and actually relationships. So parents, spouses, siblings, and children. So when we talk about family history research, we're talking about discovering these types of facts about our ancestors. And again, that doesn't sound horrible, does it? That actually sounds kind of fun and exciting. So here's an example. For those of you who've been in class before, you know that I've been working on my Bescoby line. And um, they're, they keep reusing the same names over and over and over. Probably a lot of you see that on your lines too. Like um, it doesn't have to be just John Smith. It can be John Bescoby or another favorite is Francis Bescoby. I've probably got like seriously a couple hundred Francis Bescobys in my line because they kept using that name over and over. So here are three John Bescobys. They are different, but we can't see that by looking at the names. So how do we tell them apart? Well, it's just what we said, by vital information and by relationships. So for example, our first John Bescoby is born in 1826 in Nottingham, and he is the son of John and Anne, John Bescoby and Anne Shackley. Next one is born a different year in a different county. He's in Lincolnshire, and his parents are different. William Bescoby and Mary Holland. Finally, we come to the next one, 1787. Again, very distinct as far as the year. Uh, same county as the other, but the year is enough to tell apart and the parents are enough to tell apart. So this is what we're talking about when we talk about researching to identify people uniquely because that's how we can do temple work, right? Is to identify them uniquely. Otherwise we can't tell if their temple work needs to be done or if it's already been done. So how do you find these facts? We actually talked about it in quite a bit of detail last time in the, uh, or maybe it was the time before, but it was when we talked about finding sources for people. So we're not going to dig deep into that again this time, but we'll just touch on it lightly and make the observation that many time periods and places have key records that help you identify people uniquely. So today the example is going to be on my English line. And so for that reason, we're going to focus in on English records, but, you're, if you're searching, like Bruna is here from Italy, there's other people from other places, know that these principles will apply to your place. The names of the records won't be the same, but the principles, pretty much every place that I'm familiar with will identify relationships and they will identify vital events like births, marriages, and deaths. So for our English example, there are several key records that will help us in the time period that we're searching in. And they are the three that you see on the screen, parish registers. So those are church records of births, marriages, and deaths. So the parish is just like a, a geographic location. In um, 
Church of Jesus Christ terms, it would be a branch or a ward, but in the Church of England, they would call it a parish. And parish has other meanings too, but for our purposes today, the parish, we're speaking of it as a church jurisdiction where those people lived within those boundaries and went to church together. And the next one is civil registration, which is the reporting to a government of vital events. So civil registration will typically cover at least births, marriages, and deaths. And many, many countries have civil registration. They may not always call it civil registration. Sometimes it's statutory registration, but it is the reporting of vital events to a government authority. And then finally, we've got census records, which again, many countries in the world have taken censuses and the records in, oh, and I put the dates here to let you know when the records are mainly helpful to us. So I've got to move the Zoom thing out of the way because it's covering up my title and I can't read it. There we go. So why is research still valuable. So the good brother that got up in church and, and announced to the ward that we didn't have to do research actually may not have realized that there are still some benefits to doing research, even with computer aid. So one reason is that we are working, if for those of us who are working in family tree, family searches, family tree, which I'm guessing is probably all of us or almost all of us, we're working in a shared tree and we're working with other humans who make mistakes, including us, right? We make mistakes too. And so you might come across, I'll give you an example. Just yesterday, I was, I found out that a man on my Bescoby line, his name was Ted Lancaster. He married one of the Bescoby descendants or, uh, or wait, no, I take that back. He was a descendant of the Bescobies, but his mother had married a Lancaster. So his name was Ted Lancaster, and he had married a woman named Ada Slight. S-L-I-G-H-T. That sounds pretty unique, right? Ada Slight. And so I looked in Family Tree, and I saw there was already an Ada Slight connected to Ted Lancaster. And I was like, great, this is awesome. I'm good to go. And then as I looked at it, I realized that in my research, I had found out that Ada Slight was born in Lincolnshire, the Ada Slight who married Ted Lancaster. Well, the Ada Slight that was linked to my Ted Lancaster was born in Sussex. And I could find her completely in the census. I could show that she ended up, she ended up being a totally different person. So my point is people are gonna, with the best of intentions, we're going to make mistakes. I'm guessing that the person just saw the name Ada Slight, hooked her up to Ted Lancaster and said, yep, that's such a unique name. That's got to be the right person. But it turned out it wasn't. It was a totally different Ada Slight. So there's going to be mistakes that we need to watch for and fix in Family Tree. But then the other very important point is that research is still one of the best and sometimes the only way to find people that are missing from family tree. So I did, and this is a repeat from class, but I'll repeat from a former class, but I'll repeat it because I think it's so helpful. And that is that there are about right now, according to Ron Tanner, the guru and manager of family tree, many of you have probably heard him speak. He's hilarious and I love him. He says that there's about 1.3 billion names in Family Tree. And that sounds like a lot, and it is. But if you Google to find out how many people have possibly lived on the Earth, it's around the order of between like 90 billion and 130 billion. Those are the best estimates, which means if we've only got 1.3 billion, we're missing many billions of names. And so if we look in Family Tree for those people, they aren't there. So we can't find them in Family Tree. We can find a lot of stuff in Family Tree, but not all those missing people. The only way to find them is by doing research. So how do you make research easier? Let's talk about some quick tips. First of all, use common sense. And I don't mean that facetiously. I mean it um, just something for us to remember. Learn where to find answers. Be systematic instead of haphazard. Oops, I thought there were four. There's just three. So be systematic instead of haphazard. So let's look at each one. Examples of using common sense. 
women don't have children when they're five years old. They also don't have children before they were born. I've found those mistakes on my tree where a woman born in the 1800s had children attached to her that were born in the 1500s. The mother's names were both Andell, but clearly the kids born in the 1500s couldn't be the children of the woman born in the 1800s. Men don't get married or father children after they die. I've seen that in my tree where a, a marriage date will be after the death date of the husband. Something's wrong there. It's unlikely that a, children, a couple would have 20 children, not impossible. But for me, that's often a red flag. And almost all the time, I would say 98% of the time, it indicates a bad merge. A couple percent of the time, it is a family that did the the bless her mother's the mother's heart she or bless her whole body she actually did have like 20 or 17 children or something something that is out of the norm so it does happen but at least check it out and verify it and then another one as an example every john pringle who marries a woman named eleanor isn't the same man and i probably spent i don't know weeks cleaning up multiple bad merges because somebody made the assumption that every John Pringle who married an Eleanor was the same person. And there are literally, as you know, every country has their names that they use very frequently. John Pringle lived in Northumberland and there were a boatload of John Pringles. And they also in that area seem to love the name Eleanor. So they used it repeatedly. So um, we can't just assume because the names are the same that the people are the same. So common sense. And I wanted to point out technology doesn't make common sense unnecessary. I'll give you a quick example of that. I was helping a sister in my state do a merge the other day. And as we looked at it, uh, it was I had I had done a little bit of research ahead of time, so I knew that they weren't the same person, but I wanted her to have the learning experience because it's no fun if the consultant just marches in and says, oh, here we go. I figured everything out. No, we want our the people we're helping to learn. And so she said, well, I think these people people should be merged. And I said, well, let's check it out. So we looked on the merge screen and she just didn't spend very much time and she's a bright intelligent woman so the problem seemed to be here the over trust in technology so she kind of glanced very quickly at it and said yep looks good and i said ah wait a second let's take a closer look and as as i talked her through it then she realized that even though family search the technology had said it was a duplicate or said it was a possible duplicate that actually as we looked at it carefully we could tell that it wasn't so technology is awesome but it doesn't make common sense and a little bit of sanity checking unnecessary okay finding answers. We're all going to come up against questions that we can't answer. And one of the best places that I've found to find answers, particularly as it pertains to records that might be available in the area where you're researching, is the Family Search Wiki. This is an amazing tool that covers the whole world, well, virtually the whole world, and it's growing every day. Every day, um, pages are being added to this wiki that help us research. So the way you find it is on basically any family search page. There's a few exceptions, but most pages have this menu at the top. So you click search and you click research wiki and it takes you to the family search research wiki with a search box on the front screen. And so you just enter whatever place or it's not a place to find people. The wiki does not contain names of people, but rather it contains research guidance, including what records are available in a certain location. So, in, so for this example, I, I chose South Africa genealogy. And when I did, I got this amazing page that gave me research guides and a link to the community and all these other links for places that could help me research people in South Africa. So the research wiki is an amazing tool. I love to go there and just see what records do they have that I might not already be aware of that I would like to search. Other places to find answers include the family search communities. Again, on the top menu, let me see if it's on. 
Oh, shoot, it's not. But over to the side here, imagine that you're looking at the whole page. Over here, there's a question mark. And if you click the question mark, you get a link at the bottom for communities. That's like the easiest, fastest way to get to Family Search communities. Let me get back there. This is also a live link. So when you click on this slide presentation, which we are going to provide the link to you at the end of class, then you can click on this link and go straight there. Also, Family History Centers, Ward Temple and Family History Consultants, or Stake Temple and Family History Consultants, online classes such as you're attending today, and then especially to remember to rely on the Spirit. I can't tell you how blessed I have been to pray for guidance and receive promptings from the Holy Ghost to help me know places to try or people to talk to or things that I can do to move my family history forward. So always with whatever we do, always remember to, lie, to rely on the Lord's Spirit to guide us. Okay, with that as a background, let me see how we're doing for time here. Okay, we're about halfway through. We're about right. So the research cycle, let's talk about that. Here is a, so there's the ideal and then there's real life, right? And so it, it, this is like an ideal pattern to follow with the understanding that there's going to probably be side roads and different paths and things like that. But I still think that looking at the ideal is useful to guide us in doing family history research. So the first one to reiterate what I just mentioned is to seek and rely on the spirit. And I love this, the allegory in the Book of Mormon in Jacob 5 that compares the world to a vineyard, to the Lord's vineyard. And this this particular verse, I absolutely love, verse 72, it says of the workers in the vineyard, which is all of us, they did obey the commandments of the Lord of the vineyard in all things. How exciting is that, that we have the master of the vineyard, Jesus Christ, who is willing to guide us through his spirit and help us know where we should focus and how we should focus and how to avoid mistakes. So we seek guidance from the Lord through his Holy Spirit to help us in our research. The next thing is to use what you know to discover what you don't know. This again will look familiar to some of you who are in a previous class, but I think it's worth repeating. So this is what I mean by using what you know to discover what you don't know. Let's say that you have a maybe a grandmother or a great grandmother, her, and her name is Lena Mae Beasley, and you've, you didn't meet her in life, but you know from her grave marker that she died on the 1st of, of December 1978. But let's say for whatever reason, you don't know her parents' names. Maybe you're just starting your family history, or you've searched and couldn't find them, or whatever the reason. You don't have any idea who those people are. But then you find a death certificate. The death certificate for Lena has her name and her correct death date. You know it's correct because it matches the grave marker. And the, the name is pretty unique. So you know, OK, this is, our, this is my Lena May. This is the right person. Then look what we've got further on down the death certificate. We've got father's name and mother's name. And so we've kind of built a bridge from what we knew to what we didn't know. And we're confident now, highly confident, that Lena May's dad is Ken Rose and that her mother is Sarah Pearl Dyer, it looks like. Um, and of course, we'd want to do a little more checking and verify those names, but we can be highly confident that we have been set on the right path now with the names of her parents. So that's what we mean by use what you know to discover what you don't know. Okay, next part of the research cycle is just kind of going around the circle. I put these in the center because they kind of influence every part of the rest of the cycle. So the first thing is review what you know and pray for guidance. Ask Heavenly Father where he'd like you to work. And there isn't, in my experience, there isn't just one right answer, but there could be some wrong answers. Like sometimes I've started to do things and I felt a feeling, nah, that's not the best place for you to work right now. You should actually, you know, look over here or whatever. So review what you know and pray for guidance and then set a goal. And it should be simple. The goal should not be 
break through a 25 year brick wall that the professional genealogist couldn't break through. Do you see what I'm saying? It's like, and sometimes new family historians want to do that because they're so excited. They think, okay, nobody's been able to do it yet, but I want to try. And especially when you're starting out, that can end up being very discouraging or um, can lead to mistakes. So especially in the beginning, but really always, we want to set a doable little goal that we can achieve and build on. We don't want to make the goal so big and unmanageable that it's hard to, to wrap our minds around it. So here's a very simple one that we're actually going to look at in a minute. Determine if Beatrice Dolman married. And then once you've decided on your goal, you decide what records could help you meet the goal. You look in those records and you evaluate the results and then you update family tree or your personal database, whatever it might be, and you attach sources. So let's do a demo of using the research cycle. Here is our friend Beatrice Dolman. And I had been working on her parents. And so I had found Beatrice and I had found her siblings. And so as I look over her, I look at her information. I remind myself that, okay, she was christened in 1893 in Derbyshire. For those of you who are Jane Austen fans, that's Mr. Darcy's haunt. He is from Derbyshire. And so I look at the information. I say, okay, I've got that in my head now, 1893, Derby, Derbyshire. And then I review the parents and siblings just to, again, get it in my head. So I'm kind of familiar with the context of, of this person, of Beatrice. And so now I say, okay, I'm, I'm comfortable with everything we've done so far. I'm starting to remember it. I refreshed my mind, but she doesn't have a spouse. And I wonder if she married. So, and if she married, we can trace her lines down further. So that is our goal. We're going to see if she married. Next thing is to say, okay, what records would help me in this goal? If you've researched in an area quite a bit, you'll probably be able to answer that question fairly easily. But if you haven't, that's where the wiki could come in handy. So then if you hadn't researched in this area of England in Derbyshire before, then you could go to the wiki search on Derbyshire and see what records are available for that county. But in this case, I've, I've researched in Derbyshire enough and in England enough that I'm comfortable that there are three key records that will help us meet the goal. So church mar marriage records would be very helpful if we can find the church, her marriage record. A government marriage record could also be helpful, civil registration. And then, oh, I didn't have three, I just had two, sorry. I, I must be mixing it up with the other slide where I talked about three. Okay, so those are the best records for finding marriages at this time in England for a person who was born in 1893. So where would I probably find those records? Well, family tree, as a lot of you have probably seen off to the right hand side, they will sometimes give record hints for the person. Those are records in family search historical records that look like they're a good match for the person. And in my experience, they're probably about 95 to 98% a good match. So it's really good. Occasionally, you'll find a record that you look at it more closely and go, oh, no, this doesn't apply. This is clearly a different person. But most of the time it's it's going to be right and you can also search family search historical records directly and then you can also search partner sites like ancestry find my past my heritage etc so i look at beatrice's page and guess what over at the side there is a hint for a marriage and i actually didn't didn't choose this because of the record hint this I mean this is kind of unscripted right I was like I need an example for my webinar so let's do Beatrice oh there's the record hint this is really cool there won't always be a record hint but in this case there was one and if there if you don't get a hint that looks like it's going to help answer your question then that's where you look at other records go to the wiki go to partner sites etc but in this case family search kind of handed us this record to evaluate so let's take a look see if we think that this is really for our beatrice So we look at it and um, Beatrice's, uh, her age is given at 21 
and the marriage year is 1914. So if you subtract that, it comes out to about 1893. So the age is looking good, the right birth year. It's got the right father, Robert Dolman, and the location in Derby, Derbyshire, matches the family's residence. So it's still looking really good. Like, I don't see any red flags that would make me say, Ugh, I don't think this is right. But we want to do a little bit of extra sanity checking. What I found is that if I just go on assumptions, a lot of times I'm proven wrong. Have you guys, you know what they say about assumptions, right? Never assume. And so it's always best to do a little bit of sanity checking, a little bit of research. Um, and again, we love research now on this call, right? We all know it's not a horrible word. It's a wonderful, exciting thing. And sometimes I'll just call it sanity checking, especially if I'm talking to someone that is a little bit still intimidated by research. But basically it means the same thing. It means check this out a little bit deeper and just make sure that everything is lining up. So I know from census records that Beatrice's dad was a plater. And I believe that has something to do with the railroad. Maybe somebody could put that in the chat if you know. I'd have to look it up. But I do know that he was listed as a plater. So the marriage record matches. More evidence that we've, we're on the right track here. So I am now confident that Beatrice married this Charles Tor, and that Charles's father's name is Frederick Alfred Tor, and he is a filer. Now, I don't believe that that is a filer in like a clerk's office or something. That's more of a modern interpretation. My understanding of filer at this time is it probably had something to do with filing metal. And so that's what I'm expecting. But I will say that if you ever wonder what an occupation is, Google, like, I think the terms I used were British occupations or British genealogy occupations or something like that. And there are a number of pages that people have put together that define these terms, like what is a framework knitter or what is, you know, some of them are obvious, like agricultural laborer, but some of them are not so obvious. And so if you come across one like this, where, oh, what's a plater? What's a filer? Then look for that document with old English occupations and it should help you out. But for now, we are going to, we want to add Charles as Beatrice's spouse, but we don't quite have enough information to add him yet. We've got pretty good information. Um, the main thing we're missing is where he was born, because even though he got married in Derbyshire, it's entirely possible that he was born someplace else. And if we don't know his birthplace, then we can't be confident when we do a duplicate search. So. Let's look, and this time I've gone to Ancestry, but you could do this search on um, probably any one of the partner sites and come up with the information that, that you want. So we're going to look for a definite birthplace of this Charles Tor. Just as a reminder, sometimes if I can't see the screen before, it's like out of my brain. So I put the, our key information here that he's born about 1892, probably in Derbyshire, but not guaranteed. And we do have a really good father's name, a very complete father's name, Frederick Albert Tor, who is a filer. So we put this information in and we search. And guess what? Presto, cuckoo, whatever, you know, those cooking shows where you just throw something in the oven and then it comes out. That's kind of what we have to do here in the interest of time. So I won't walk you through actually doing the search, but this is what I found. So in the 1901, we've got Frederick A. Tor. Everything's lining up. He's a filer and his whole family is born in Derby, Derbyshire. Then going to the 1911, we find Frederick again. And oh, by the way, Charles is there. Here's Charles. And here he is. He was Charlie in the 1901 census. I love it. So as an eight-year-old, he apparently went by Charlie. And here he is. Here's Frederick, the dad. And again, he's a filer. And all the family is born in Derby, Derbyshire. So I, I recommend it, as, as you might remember from the last class, that you never want to rely on just one record because it's too easy to make a mistake that way. So that's why I wanted to find two census records. And they confirmed 
what we suspected that the family was born in Darby, the dad's occupation is right, everything lines up. So now I'm very comfortable that Charles was born about 1892 in Darby, Derbyshire. So the next step is to add him to family tree. So we go to Beatrice and we click add spouse and we fill out the form with all the information that we now know that we're now confident of and again I didn't script this and so sometimes you will find somebody already in family tree and sometimes you won't and so if it had said no match is found or if it if I decided this match was not correct then I would have created a person based on that but as I look at this everything is lining up. The, the unique father's name, Frederick Albert Tor. The mother is Esther. I don't know if you noticed that. Let's pop back here. Um, it's a little hard to read on this screen. Wait, just a sec. Sorry. There we go. Um, but you can kind of see there, mom's name is Esther. And so as I look at this match right here, the years all look good. The place looks good. He's born in Derby. And so I do feel that this is a good match. So in this case, I click add match and Charles now appears as Beatrice's husband. It's a cool thing. Then remember, it's not the research start and stop. It's the research cycle. So then the next thing we do. Oh, I forgot again. Okay. Um, I forgot that I had the slide. I apologize. And this is very important. The next thing that you always want to do after you've added a new person is to attach the sources. And you can attach a lot of them from record hints many times. But if you found them in other places, you also want to attach them there. Because that way, you'll help other people who come along later. And you will also help yourself. Because I've come along to records that I've maybe researched a few years ago. Do you think I remember what I did on those records? Not so much. It's like it's so long gone. And so to have those sources there will be a great blessing to you in addition to other people. So because we went, again, in detail about attaching sources in an earlier class, we're not going to go through that today. But I just did want to highlight that it is very important to add sources to substantiate the, the information that you're adding to family tree. Okay, so now is the part that I meant to, that I was talking about earlier is now that we've cycled through and we found Beatrice's husband, Charles. Well, I look at this and I see there's no children. Did they have kids? Who knows? Let's look. So, I mean, not us right now, but that's what I would do in my research is then I'd start the cycle over again. Oh, my new goal is see if Charles and Beatrice had children. Where would I look for that, et cetera, et cetera. Okay, last part of the class today, excuse me a minute, is just to comment on the value of using a research log. This is another one of those things that I think can be very intimidating, and I hope to share some thoughts about how to make it less intimidating. So what is a research log? First of all, it's important to understand that. So it's just very simply a document where you record information as you find it. Things you want to include are what you found, when and where you found it, any contradictions or problems, and what you want to do next. Why do you want to do that? Isn't that a little bit tedious? Well, it's worse not to do it. So the reason you want to do it is that, that it helps you keep track of information you found. And I think most of us, once we start working on multiple generations and even multiple lines, it will all blend into a bowl of spaghetti in our heads unless we track it in some way. It also helps you keep track of what sources you've searched so that you know what you've already done and what you still need to do. It helps you avoid repeating the same searches. Have any of you had this experience? So you do a search, you find some stuff, you forget to write it down, then you get distracted and you don't do family history for a month. Then you come back and you start doing searches and you get this strange sense of deja vu. And then you realize that you've just spent the last hour repeating the work that you did a month ago. I've done that more than I care to admit. So keeping a research log because I think, oh, I'll remember it didn't happen. So it helps you avoid repeating the same searches and it saves you time.
And then also, as Elder Esplan was saying at the beginning, um, sometimes parts of his tree get messed up in family tree, your research log can serve as a very helpful backup in case you need to correct things in family tree. So there are different styles of research logs. This one is chronological where you just and chronological in the order in which you found the information. I should make that clear. So it's not chronological for the life of the person. It's chronological of of the order in which you found the information. So it's just got where did you research? What was your goal, basically? If you have a call number, et cetera, et cetera. These forms are available online. You can just Google and find a, a variety of research forms. Another form that I love is called the Timeline Grid. And this one is different than when you collect information in the order in which you find it. Instead, in the Timeline Grid, it is for places with regular census records. And so it has a column for every census that you expect to find for the family and a row for every person. It's just a table. It's that you don't, this is, um, I've actually got templates. I think I put the link in here to it. So you can just copy templates. It, there's no charge. It's just a free table, or you can create your own in a spreadsheet or in Word or whatever. So it's just a table and it centers on one family. So a, a couple and their children. It's, as I said, most useful in countries and time periods with regular census records. Doesn't help so much like in pre-1841 England, where you've just, you're mostly using church records, this format doesn't really work there. And in a nutshell, it shows key, for, key family information organized into a compact space. This is an example of a completed grid. So that, if you're like me, I tend to it helps me a lot to see something instead of just hear about it. So here you can see that um, we've got the column for every census, and then I've got the row for every person in that family. So Thomas, here's his information in 1871. Here's his information in 81, 91, et cetera. Here's his wife, Anne. Here's all her information through the census. Again, here's William. Although he ends up going to work as a farm laborer with somebody in a nearby parish. So I, you notice I had to put a different location for where his census was taken and I colored it orange and colored him orange so I could tell it apart from the other from the parents who were still living in the same place. So that's just an example of how you can capture information on the timeline grid and just you can capture it in any order because you've always already set up the framework for the censuses where you expect to find the family. So the, the purpose of that was not to go into a deep dive on the timeline grid, but if you want to learn more about it, visit this website, tinyurl.com slash timeline hyphen grid, and that will take you to a place with templates and a wiki article and webinars and different things that will help you if you decide that that might be helpful for your research. And so um. You can look online, as I mentioned, I would just Google research log templates. And the important thing is not that you use either of the two things that I illustrated today. Find what works for you, but use something. You'll be so glad that you did.